Hi, Ted. Hi, Bob. How you doing? Not bad. Not, Not bad. bad? Well, we'll settle for that. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show. You are Ted Chang, and we're about to have a conversation that I'm very excited about. You are a celebrated science fiction writer, uh, and even people who aren't science fiction fans in particular have probably heard of the movie Arrival, which is based on a short story you wrote and uh, called Story of Your Life. And that story had itself been celebrated. Uh, it had won a number of awards, including the Nebula, right? Uh, awards. Yes. Uh, and, and, and actually had been written, you know, sometime before the, the, the movie. Uh, but, um, but anyway, it became this, this uh, world-famous movie. And it's what we're going to talk about largely today are the philosophical questions raised by the short story some of which make it into the movie more than others, I would say, or, the, or, uh, or, the, or, or, the, or let's just say they're present in fuller form in the story than in the, the, the movie. Um, and they touch on, you know, free will, the question of, you know, determinism, can, you know, can information move backwards and forward in time and so on. Of course, if anyone who's seen the movie knows that there's a uh, a time travel dimension to the movie, actually more than there is uh, in the in the story itself. Um, but before we get into these depths, I, I want to ask you a couple of superficial, mundane questions about just okay. the experience of having your story kind of blow up like that. I assume that there are kind of two phases. First, you find out it's been optioned, right? Is that the way it works? Or did you know right away that it was actually going to become a movie and, and hadn't just been optioned? Well, so actually, in, um, in my case, it wasn't even optioned an initially. Um, I was contacted by a couple of producers. Um, they, uh, they became aware of the story because uh, the screenwriter, Eric Heiserer, he was a fan of the story. And uh, he pitched the idea of an adaptation to these producers. And um, they read the story, and uh, they liked the idea. But, um, so, I mean, they got in touch with me. They wanted, um, they wanted permission for him to uh, write a screenplay. Uh, but they didn't have any money to option the film. Hmm. So uh, actually, what, so what they were asking for was a um, what's known as a shopping agreement um, that would give them, for a limited period of time, the right to develop uh, the property. But um, there was no money involved, and there was also no um, commitment involved. If after, after the end of that period I wanted to walk away, I was free to do so. Okay. So... Um, uh, so I agreed to that, and Eric Heiserer, he wrote a draft of the screenplay, and um, then with that, they uh, tried to find some financing. Um, but it, uh, it was a while before they could do that, before they were able to find anyone interested in financing it. Only when they were able to find someone interested in financing it did they actually... Uh, option the story. Mm -hmm. uh, then you know after they optioned the story, and, and just it, to clarify, at that point, so they get, at that point they give you some money and they have the option to turn it into a movie. But there's usually at that stage there's there's no assurance that it'll become a movie. And in fact, most things that are optioned, I gather, do not become movies. Was, was that is <laughs> that is absolutely true. The vast majority of things that are optioned uh, never go any further. Um, so, but, uh, yeah, in, in my case, it was a while before we even got to the option stage. And then after that, it was quite a while, uh, more before, uh, it, uh, it started, uh, seeming like they would actually be able to make a movie. Mm -hmm. And then at some point it became clear there was actually going to be a movie and it was going to star Amy Adams and, and right. I mean, at some point this, this thing moved to a, another level. Uh, yes, eventually it did. Uh, and that must have been kind of a thrill. Um, it, yeah, well, it, 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 it was uh, absolutely very exciting. Um, I, but, you know, 
over the over the years of the process prior to that, I had uh, I had become very uh, acutely aware of just how how unlikely any of these things are, and also how um, uh, how often projects reach the point where it seems like it's a sure thing, and then it turns out it's not a sure thing at all. Um, there have been many movies where they have a director attached, they have a big name star attached, um, they think they're you know they think it's a lock, and then turns out it's not a lock at all. So you yourself had been partway through this cycle before, or you had just heard of this? Uh, no, I I I I was hearing a lot of stories. Okay, and so but this one did happen. It did, and it became very big, and, and uh, I guess there's. Uh, there's the point when you see what the movie itself looks like, uh, but I gather you had already, you had long before been involved in in, look, in at least seeing the script. So, kind of major departures, bet- you know, for the story in the movie were, those weren't like a surprise when you watched the movie. Uh, I had, uh, I had read an early draft of the script, um, and, um, you know, even before he had finished the script, uh, the screenwriter Eric Heiserer, he had pitched me his vision for the film, so I did. Uh, uh, I did know right from the start, uh, sort of his general uh, intentions and what direction he was going in. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I guess without getting into the plot spoiling yet, uh, we can say that on the one hand, they didn't provide all the dimensions of kind of the, the philo- scientific and scientific slash philosophical questions that are in this story, but I would say they went about as far as you could reasonably expect Hollywood to go, and on the other hand, it seems to me they, they added major plot dimensions, but again, they can be forgiven, I think. I mean, it, I mean, it's the kind of thing you would expect Hollywood to do, I would say, across the board. Is that kind of your view? Um, yes, uh, I, I think that, um, you know, for people who uh, have only read the story, I think, uh, you know, if you didn't know that it ha- had been made into a movie, a lot of people say, this story is unfilmable. Um, you know, it's a very internal story. A lot of it takes place inside uh, the protagonist's head. Um, it has uh, a lot of physics and linguistics in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so... Uh, you know, and, and it has it. It also has some uh, some pretty, I'd say, maybe challenging philosophical notions in it. So, um, you know, obviously, for it to work as a as a motion picture that people might actually go see, there are going to have to be a lot of changes. Um, so. Uh, you know, I you know, I completely understand like all the changes they made, and I do think that um, I think the film does uh, capture uh, the heart of the story, and um, I think it does a better job of adaptation than uh, most anyone would have thought possible, uh, just given how unlikely the source material is. Mm-hmm. It's also very literary. I, I mean, in addition to being maybe not inherently cinematic, it, it seems to me, I mean, I'm not a big science fiction reader, but it seems to me more literary than a lot of written science fiction is. And I gather that's been noted about your writing? Um, I, uh, I don't know. I think, I, think, um, I think in general science fiction has sort of a, a, uh, an undeserved bad reputation among people who uh, among literary who snobs uh, among people who don't yeah who, who don't read it um, I no, think, I think it, they think of like spaceships and and crazy you know fantastic creatures and stuff and, and one thing I mean is you you don't have a whole lot of that but I also mean yours is very uh, you know the, the protagonist is very reflective and there's a lot about the relationship to her child and so on but sorry I interrupted you go ahead and say what else you might have wanted to say. Well, I guess, um, you know, I think there is a popular conception of 
what science fiction is, which uh, is, I think, largely formed by uh, Hollywood movies. Um, but that is not, uh, I think, an accurate indication of what um, written science fiction is like. Um, so, um, so I guess I would say that, you know, um, my work is, uh, uh, less unusual for written science fiction than, uh, Arrival is for filmed science fiction. I think Arrival departs from the conventions of Hollywood science fiction far more mm -hmm. than my work departs from sort of what you might expect in written science fiction. That's interesting. And in what way? You mean there's just less in the way of, like, spaceships shooting at each other and, and or, or what? In, in the movie, I mean. Uh, well, yes, because, you know, yeah, because the movie is, is very much not the typical Hollywood science fiction film. Mm -hmm. I think, the, you know, the typical Hollywood science fiction film has uh, a lot of uh, spectacular uh, fight sequences and special effects. Right. And um, and it usually ends with the hero and villain sort of trading punches at the edge of a cliff. Right. This is um, this is not at all like a video game. This mo this movie, whereas some science fiction movies are. I mean, you know, uh, so uh, so yeah. So Arrival, I think, departs from uh, uh, a lot of the conventions of movie science fiction mm -hmm. uh, pretty dramatically. So. Anyway, I gather, has this changed your life? I mean, you still have a day job? Um, I still have a day job. And that is, that's involved in, in uh, what writing things for... The software industry. For the software industry. But not like user manuals. It's, it's, it's other kinds of stuff, or is it? What? Uh, it's um, more technical. Uh, uh, um, my audience is uh, programmers rather than end users. Okay. Uh, so, but anyway, I guess it, it sounds like a very wonderful development in someone's life, so congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. Now, uh, let's get, let's move towards some of these philosophical questions. At this point, I, I think we should, we should be willing to do plot spoilers, right? I mean, uh, and, sure, and we, should, absolutely. we should warn people uh, that we're about to do them. Let me... Um, give you my summary of things that I would say the story and the movie have in common kind of plot wise and uh, and see if, if you think I get uh, anything wrong okay so these creatures from outer space arrive uh, they have seven appendages and so are called heptapods uh, they the, the protagonist is a linguist now, in the movie, her name is Louise, and her name doesn't come up much in the story. Is it the same name in the story, or it is? It, it is. It is Louise. Because the male is, has a different name in the story in the movie, right, or not? Yeah, Gary, yes. Gary, Gary becomes Ian in the movie. But, so it's Louise. Um, she's a linguist, and the, you know, the military people who are handling all, <laughs> who are in charge of uh, alien arrivals, summon her and, and ask her if she can help them decode the utterances of the heptapods. Um... We discovered that their language is fundamentally different from uh, human language. It is not so kind of sequential and, you might say, linear. <clears throat> so, like, the written version of it doesn't, you know, doesn't, like, start on the left and end on the right. It's more like a, a jumble of elements that are perceived more holistically. And this difference between their language and ours, I guess you could say, if at the risk of putting it too crudely, allows them to see the future, allows them to know uh, what's going to happen in the future. Um, Louise learns enough of their language so that she acquires this capability to see some of the future. Uh, so when she falls in love with Gary or Ian, depending on whether you're reading or watching the movie, um, and... Uh, he says, do you want to make a baby at some point, in some romantic moment? She says yes, even though she knows, because she could see the future, that the offspring, her daughter, is going to die at a relatively young age. Um, but she says yes. She embraces it. Um, 
Mere just as a quick footnote, I mean, some people might see, I don't think you were primarily interested in the ethical philosophy of, like, should you decide to have a child if you know this about their future? But the ethical question is somewhat different in the book and the movie, just in the sense that in the movie, the child dies younger and after a horrible illness. And in in the uh, short story, it's... He is, lives a little longer, and the life, it, the child's life is less compromised in the meanwhile, I, I guess you might say. The, but that's kind of a footnote. But um, do I have it more or less right so far, and is there anything you want to comment on or elaborate on? Um, that's basically, I think that's, that's, that's a reasonable description. No, no major elements uh, of the story, at least, that I left out. The movie has whole other elements, uh, plot-wise. I mean, I mean, so does the story, in a way, but... Uh, but yeah, so I mean, I'd say that um, you know the story is mostly about uh, the protagonist um, going ahead uh, with a future, despite knowing that the future will hold great pain for her. Um, I think that is, you know, that general idea is found in both the story and the film. Some of the specifics uh, differ. Mm-hmm. But in general, it is about the, um, uh, yeah, knowing that the future holds great pain, specifically uh, being a parent uh, with the knowledge that uh, your child will die before you. Right. So there is, um, now again, in the movie, there's a whole element of, uh, a geopolitical element, where in dealing with the aliens, the nations can't decide whether they're on the same page, there's the threat of conflict, uh, and, and there's that, and, and, and the way that's resolved is through a kind of uh, information traveling from the future to the present, and, and, and so on. That's actually not in the story, interestingly, um, but that's the kind of thing I think you'd expect Hollywood to do. But of, the, of these, so of the two, philo- so there's the, there's the ethical question I just, that we just mentioned, and then there's the more, like, a metaphysical question that we will flesh out at greater length shortly, um, just about, like, well, if you know the future, can you have free will? Do you have the option of doing anything other than what you know the future holds, you know, and, and so on. But were you very interested in the strictly ethical question as opposed to what you might call the metaphysical question of free will? Uh you mean the ethical question of like, bringing a child into the world? Bringing a child, even though you know that the, the child's... Well, again, in the movie, the child's life is a lot worse than in the short story. But, uh, but as you said, it's certainly knowing that, that it's going to hold great pain for you. The untimely demise of your child is going to hold great pain for you. I guess it's more of an ethical question to the extent that the child is going to suffer. But, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that question as opposed to the kind of metaphysical question. Well, um, as you know, you know, the, um, it's only in the movie that, uh, the child's life, uh, involves any sort of suffering in the story. The child's life does not involve any, uh, undue suffering. Uh, her death is uh, sudden and, uh, unexpected. So, uh, so when I was writing the story, you know, you know, the eth- there were those ethical I- issues did not arise, right. and so yeah, that was not really my concern. Um, the you know they they had to make certain changes uh, for the movie, and as a result of those changes, there that ethical question does you know potentially arise. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's so you know we could discuss that, but you know that's the uh, that was not that was not part of my uh, original conception. Okay, it, it was more confined to the pain that the woman herself who was making the decision would suffer by virtue yes. of the decision. Now yes. let's, uh, by way of approaching the kind of metaphysical philosophical questions, or the, all the free will stuff, why don't we elaborate a little on the, the, the part of the science that you find in the short story that is uh, maybe alluded to a little in the movie but certainly isn't fleshed out. And this is something I didn't really know. But the, the, the idea is that, you know, when we think of laws of physics as involving, like, initial conditions kind of causing things to happen in the future, you know, and, and, and this kind of 
pushing of causality through into the future. Um, and you make the point that there's, I guess with some physical dynamics, there's an alternative way of describing them. And here I'm actually going to quote from uh, a guy who actually wrote a blog post about your movie named Chad Orzel. And he, he wrote a piece for uh, Forbes that, that is probably worth uh, looking at. But, but the least action principle, he says, is if you know the state of the system at the start and end, the system moves from one state to another through whatever sequence of intermediate states minimizes the action, where action is a physical, con you know, quantitative concept we needn't get into. But uh, the point is, you can interpret this as like the physical system, uh, in some sense, knowing what the end state is going to be and, and computing what the most efficient path to the end state is going to be, right? It does. It, 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 yeah, it can, it can seem that way. Yes. And, and the example you use in the story is this uh, Fermat's uh, principle of something about light refraction, right? Fermat's principle of least time. Um, because uh, in optics, uh, the path that light takes is uh, not always the shortest path, but it is the fastest path. Um, when the light is, say, crossing uh, between uh, materials where it has a different velocity. So, uh, so light being refracted, say, between air and water um, does not travel in a straight line, which would be the shortest path. Right. It travels in a bent line, but the, that bent path um, uh, minimizes the, the total travel time because of uh, it, it sort of increases the amount of uh, the trip uh, taken in uh, in air where the speed of light is faster than it is in water. So if you imagine a ray of light, now people just listening to this on podcast can't see this, but the ray of light hits the water here, and then it like bends, and if, and if you see the kind of the end point, right where my thumb is, of where the light reaches eventually, turns out this, this although not a straight path, was the fastest path path uh, by which the light could have gotten to this end point, right? Yes. And, yes. And so that does raise this interesting question of, you know, and you even use the word teleology in the short story, I think, of whether you can think of just physical systems. I mean, generally, we think of teleological purposeful systems as, you know, maybe systems of life can be thought of that way. They have plans and pursue them. But you, in this scenario, physical systems... Uh, can, through one interpretation of, of these ideas, be conceived of as themselves kind of teal. At least that's the way the character talks in the book, in the, in the short story, right? Yes, yes. And, I mean, this, this, has, this has been noted uh, by physicists uh, for quite some time, and some physicists have written at length about uh, the philosophical sort of implications of this. Mm -hmm. And the language that the... Uh, that the aliens use in, in, in the story opens their consciousness, their awareness to this way of looking at things. And, and maybe we should stop here and say that, that there is this idea that linguists debate of, of to what extent does the structure of one's language determine one's view, shape one's view of the world. So like if, in, if one language has uh, 11 words for 11 shades of purple. Do people in that culture actually see shades of purple that people in our culture don't see and so on? But, but that's another really interesting part of both the movie and the story, right? That, that language shapes our worldview. Uh, yes, yeah. That's uh, uh, either linguistic relativity or linguistic determinism, depending on how, how strong a position you want to take, or um, the superior wharf hypothesis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the strongest forms of that are generally um, dismissed by uh, linguists. But, um, you know, um, there are, you know, there is some evidence for sort of weaker examples, like the one you cite about having, you know, uh, certain color vocabulary. Uh, does that make it easier for, for, for someone to discriminate uh, finer distinctions in color? Mm -hmm. And we should also say that, I mean, these linguists, you're right, the ones who have been skeptical have have looked at the kind of, like, you might say, fine-grained manifestation of the question, right? Like, okay, one human language versus another. But 
that's a little different from the question of what if just you know, what if it was just different from human language altogether, which is what your uh, kind of, well, I, I mean, I will say, I guess the, the, the alien lang written language has in some ways more in common with, say, an, an ideographic language, but you, you, you emphasize that it's not the, the same thing. I mean, basically, we're talking about a language that's just fundamentally different from human language, right? Yes, the, the written language in the story, the written language that the heptapods use, is unlike any writing system uh, that humans have ever used. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, but you know, I, I I also you know do want to you know say that I don't actually believe that learning an alien language would enable you know people to you know see the future. Uh, that was uh, I was taking some dramatic license there. Yeah. But it could be that having a very fundamentally different kind of brain could change things more fundamentally. Uh, you know, brain very different from anything that, that would have evolved on our planet. Does that make sense? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, think, I certainly think that uh, a species with a, a, a really different type of brain, you know, could perceive the universe very differently than we do. Um, and, whether that gives them knowledge of the future, you know, that's, well, that's a, that's a different question. Right, but, I mean, you certainly could argue, well, maybe we should step back and, and talk about kind of Einstein's universe and how time is conceived in Einstein's universe, which I think you know more about uh, than I do, probably. Do you want to you wanna, uh, talk about that? Uh, okay, I can talk a bit about that. Um, so... Um... Einstein's relativity does pretty strongly uh, imply that uh, there's no difference between the future and the past, that uh, the future is just as fixed as the past is. Um, this is a consequence of um, what is known as the relativity of simultaneity. Uh, in a pre-Einsteinian uh, view of the world, in a Newtonian view, the idea of simultaneity was um, sort of, it was assumed that simultaneity was universal, that it, would, it was possible for everyone to agree on what events were simultaneous. Um, what Einstein realized was that um, it was actually not possible for everyone in the universe to agree on what was simultaneous. Um, people who are in the same frame of reference can agree, but people who are in different frames of reference, uh, someone who is moving at a substantial fraction of the speed of light relative to me, they will see different uh, events as being simultaneous than I will see as being simultaneous. They, will, they may see certain events um, that I consider having taken place in the past as being simultaneous with other events even though I would see those other events as being simultaneous to, to my present. Um, likewise, someone else might see events that I see as happening in the present. Uh, they might see them as happening in their future, or, actually, or I guess I should say events that I see in my future, they will see as happening in, the, in their present. Um, and so by the, you know, because of, you know, uh, because there is no privileged frame of reference in relativity, we cannot say that any uh, particular observer is correct, mm -hmm. um, no, and, and whereas others are incorrect. All observers uh, are correct. And the only way uh, for that to make sense is for the events which I see as happening in the future, they have to be, they have to already exist for these other observers to see them as simultaneous mm. with events that I see as uh, in the present. So that means um, events that, you know, uh, events that take place in my future, they have uh, just as much reality as events that take place in the present or in the past. Uh, that is the only way to reconcile the fact that uh, observers in different frames of reference have these 
sort of incompatible ideas of simultaneity. Hmm. And so as a result, um, you, uh, you get what is often called the, uh, the block universe view of time in which uh, this, they, you know, is usually described as like all events past, present, and future, they are all sort of frozen in one gigantic block. Uh, what we perceive as the present is simply, you know, a simple two-dimensional slice through that block, which is uh, sort of advancing. That is our perception of, of time. Uh, but, but the events that we think of as taking place in the future, they are frozen in the block just as much as the events that were in the past. So, uh, so um, in that sense, yeah, there, uh, the, the future is just as determined as the past. And it is, we, you, you don't have a situation where, uh, you know, the past is fixed, whereas the future is, uh, it's undetermined. Yeah. And the reason again, is that, once you start getting into the relativity of different perspectives, you realize that there is a perspective from which my future has already happened, kind of? Yes, yes. Okay, I've never heard it put quite like that. That's interesting. But, but so the idea is that time, you know, people, you hear about the space-time continuum, and you think, well, I guess I know what that means, but you, you still don't necessarily visualize time as being a dimension very much the way space is, but... In a way, that's the implication here, right? In other words, like right now, I see that both north and south are like fixed. I can just look look to, in either direction and see that they're fixed. I can't do that with time as a practical matter, but the idea is that that just reflects a limit on my perception. The future is out there much the way north is out there, right? Yes, yes. And so... That's why we said you can imagine a very different kind of brain that could see the future. Um, yep, possibly, possibly. Um, uh, I mean, it might have to be a brain. I don't know. Maybe this universe cannot accommodate such a brain, or we don't know. But but uh, but in principle, you can imagine such a thing. So I, I think the reason that's useful in, in 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 you know to get back to the your work is that. You know, at first you think, you know, when I when I ran into that teleological uh, conception of kind of physical causality, it seems very alien at first because we think of, you know, just causality, it like pushes. You start with this, that causes that to happen, which causes that to happen, which causes that to happen. But in Einstein's universe, it's just a stream. It's just, it's just like a road or something. And it, it, it makes no more, you know, in a way it makes no more sense to say that, that this point in time caused, you know, that the state of things at this point of time caused the state of things at T plus one than to say it in reverse almost, right? I mean... Yes, that is, that is absolutely correct. So, so in that sense, the idea of looking at the end state of the physical system and letting that determine you know, what ha has happened since the initial state is not crazy. <laughs> it's right. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very counterintuitive to us, but, um, yeah, from a physics standpoint, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing uh, peculiar about it. Okay. So, you have taken, I can tell, uh, you have taken this idea very seriously, <laughs> this idea of determine, that the future is actually determined, and, you, and you've wrestled with it philosophically, and now I want to get into how you do the wrestling and how that's done in the short story and how it's done in other things you've written, but let me first ask, do you spend, have you spent so much time thinking about it because it bothers you in a way? Um, I, su I suppose, um, uh, I would say that you know I I think I'm pretty comfortable with the idea of determinism. I think more comfortable than a lot of people are. Um, uh, I think you know, a lot of people uh, uh, 
a lot of people have a very strong sort of visceral opposition to, say, the idea of um, materialism, that we are simply made of matter, because, um, because materialism sort of implies a kind of determinism, and people, uh, uh, people want to think that, you know, uh, you know, that they're sort of uh, the author of their own decisions, and uh, they don't feel that determinism uh, offers them that. And I'm pretty comfortable with that, I think. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I, but I, I do think it is um, an interesting topic. I think, um, I, you know, I certainly recognize why people resist the idea. Um, I recognize, you know, how sort of, you know, counterintuitive it is to, you know, our sense of self. Um, uh, and, you know, I'm not going to say that I have, you know, completely and fully, you know, internalized, you know, all the, you know, implications of this worldview. Um, but I think I'm probably more comfortable with it than a lot of people. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, one way to think about it is like, I mean, the way most people wrestle with it is, oh gosh, the future is determined, so is there any point in doing anything? But that's a little different from the question of, well, I already know what the future is, <laughs> which is what the situation the aliens are in and the situation in which uh, Louise is. Um well, yeah, so there's this difference between, like, determinism by itself doesn't imply, you know, foreknowledge or, you know, uh, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't imply that you know what's going to happen. It just implies that uh, there's only one possible thing that can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so determinism by itself, uh, you know, isn't uh, as, it, 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 I would say it needn't provoke the you know terrible existential crisis that uh, a lot of people feel it does because you know yes there may be only one future but you don't know what it is so um, so it has no practical you know effect on your decision making now am I in, unusual in your experience in having in some ways the opposite reaction which is I think I'd find it very reassuring if somebody told me the future was determined because then I could relax um, I guess I I, I don't uh, yeah I think. You are uh, probably atypical in just the the pe- people I've talked to about uh, the topic. It would be such a burden unloaded, right? Um, uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's it's uh, maybe maybe not. I think it. Would, <laughs> I think uh, that is something that you know that people could well, discuss. Or to, or to look at it to look look at it uh, kind of retrospectively the question in other words you could reassure yourself you had not made any consequential mistakes right it's like no you couldn't have you know this career path that you think was disastrous you you had no choice you can't blame yourself right in a deterministic world that would be kind of reassuring wouldn't it um well okay i guess you know certainly some people yes some people do think that this absolves them of all responsibility um i um I don't think anyone who, uh, any serious philosopher uh, uh, of, you know, on, on these questions supports that view. I don't think anyone, any philosopher would say that you are absolved of all responsibility from your actions. Um, now, although there are uh, people who, um, this is a little different, but people who look at uh, criminals and say, look, given their, the environment they were born into, given, maybe given their genes, we don't know, but whatever, but given the set of circumstances impinging on them, um, we shouldn't punish people because, quote, retribution is a moral good, right? That presupposes free will. We should only punish them to the extent that that will be useful in deterring others or in rehabilitating them or having some practical benefit. So there are... I think moral philosophers who say that a somewhat deterministic view of behavior has implications uh, for the way uh, the law should work. There should be no punishment just for retribution in this view. 
That, you know, that is true. Uh, although I guess I would say, um, you know, the, uh, uh, there's sort of a distinction there between, you know, sort of the physical determinism that we were just talking about and other, you know, like sort of things like genetic determinism or, uh, you know, uh, social determinism, which uh, have, you know, might be more proximate causes of someone's actions. You know, in, in terms of, you know, physical determinism, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you know it's, that's more along the lines of, well, um, I'm not responsible for the boundary conditions of the universe at the Big Bang, so therefore you can't, you know, do anything to hold me responsible for my actions. You know, that, you know, uh, that is sort of the, you know, I think the, the theoretical question, you know, underlying physical determinism. Um, and that's not an argument I think anyone brings up, you know, when uh, defending the actions of, uh, you know, someone who uh, was raised in an abusive you know, household or, you know. Right. Uh, Although they could use physical determinism in the same way. I mean, as a practical matter, they point to specific circumstances, but in as a logical matter, they could say, look, everything was inevitable. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, we, we needn't get off on moral on this, this particular moral philosophy tangent. But, um, but let's, uh, so let's get b back to this. So, okay, so there's kinds of two questions that are raised here. There's the question of like, if you just if you accept determinism as the truth about your future, but don't know what your future is going to do, how might that influence your attitude? Um, and then there's the question of, suppose you knew that future. And that's the situation uh, the aliens in, are in, the heptapods are in, and Louise is in. And I think, I think the idea, I think you see a connection. In other words, it seems to me that when you talk about how the heptapods kind of view... Uh, their situation, I th isn't that kind of supposed to have implications for how a person who believes in determinism but doesn't know what their future is going to be sh could think about their circumstance? The two are kind of related in terms of what kind of psychological adaptation you make, or does that not make any sense at all? Um, I mean, there, there's probably there is probably some connection. But I, yeah, you know, I, I do think that um, there is a there is a pretty uh, profound difference between, um, you know, not knowing the future and you know what sort of psychological states you know you can have, and then knowing the future, and you know what psychological states you can have in that situation. I feel right. like you know the uh, you know there is a uh, a pretty there is a pretty big difference. Right. Let me well, let me read. Uh... From your short story, a couple of things you say about the the heptapods. Uh, one is, what distinguishes the heptapods' mode of awareness is not just that their actions coincide with history's events, it is also that their motives coincide with history's purpose. They act to create the future to enact chronology. To create the future, comma, to enact chronology. Um, there's that. Uh, and here's another thing you say. So you talk about what they have as um, simultaneous consciousness, meaning it's the consciousness of, uh, you know, not just this moment in time, but, but, but the future as well. And you say, freedom isn't an illusion. It's perfectly real in the context of sequential consciousness. Um, that's the kind of consciousness humans have, sequential consciousness. Within the context of simultaneous consciousness... Freedom is not meaningful, but neither is coercion. It's simply a different context, no more or less valid than the other. And then you say it's like an opt it's like an optical illusion. You know, the one where you is this a is this a, a, a an old woman? You know, on the left with a profile on the on the left facing right, or is it this upside down young woman facing? You know, you we've all seen that optical illusion. You mentioned that here. Um, is that I mean, is, the, is some of that some, something that somebody who is a determinist could kind of uh, take away and and use as a way to look at their own situation, even though they can't see the future? Um, could be, could be. <laughs> um, I'm looking for guidance here. I, I'm, you know, I'm. 
I, 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 I'm, I'm forced to take the possibility of determinism seriously, and I'm. Uh, well, but I mean, I turn to you for guidance. But well, just a few minutes ago, you said that you actually thought it might be a relief to in know that. In some ways, in some ways, although I, I worry that then I would just become a drug addict, and of course that gets back to the well. Anyway, uh, <laughs> go, go, go ahead and say anything you're going to say. Um. Uh. Well, yeah. Um, well, I, I guess, you know, just with regard to, you know, the question of, say, whether you should, you know, become a drug addict or not, uh, I'd say that, you know, there's a difference between um, determinism and fatalism. Uh, fatalism is the idea that, you know, whatever is going to happen will happen no matter what you do. Um, that is not implied by determinism. Uh, determinism just, you know, your actions, you know, you know, they do sort of matter, you know, your actions will uh, lead, you know, to different you know, outcomes. Um, so, yeah, so in that sense, you know, you do, uh, you have reason to get out of bed in the morning, you know, because, yes, the future will be different, you know, with, you know, uh, Depending, you know, a future, you know, you will have different futures if you stay in bed versus if you get out of bed. Yeah, but, I mean, it's, so it's true. Your behavior is part of the stream of causality. Uh, so what it is does have implications for the future. But if you're a determinist, you feel that what your behavior is can only be one thing. So, like, why put the effort into trying to influence your own behavior? Um, well, uh... Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't think that, you know, yeah, I, I don't think determinism, uh, means that you don't have to make an effort. Uh, you are, you are the product of, you know, like, so your, your decision making process the the the, the decision making process in your brain, while it is deterministic, it is a result of uh, a lifetime of experience. It, you know, your decision making is uh, sort of a computation based on uh, you know decades of inputs, and um, so you know your your actions, your volition. Uh, is a you know uh, is a comp you know is is a result of all those inputs, and you know it's a result of you know these inputs that you are currently receiving right now. Um, you know, so it is uh, uh, it is an extraordinarily you know uh, uh, complicated uh, sort of algorithm being, you know, being worked out, uh, that is, um, pretty much unique because of, because, you know, no one else has had all those inputs. No one else has had the same, you know, set of inputs. Uh, so, uh, so in that sense, you know, uh, you, uh, you are not a simple automaton. You are um, uh, you are sort of you are sort of performing a a unique calculation. Uh, you're you're performing a calculation that uh, based on inputs, which is not happening anywhere else in the world, in the universe, not happening in anyone else's head. Right. right. And um, that you know that unique computation. That is, in some sense, you. That's what makes you, you. Right, although the way you put it there, the unique computation is me, is different from saying I'm performing the computation, which is the way you put it earlier. I mean, some people would say that according to determinism, it's not that you're performing the computation. You are the computation. Sit back yes. and enjoy it. You are yes. the computation. Yes, uh, yeah, okay, yes. Uh, yeah. So, okay, well, I guess there are worse things than being a unique computation. Uh the uh so okay so there is um 
Now again, the question though of how to wrestle with determinism as we humans do, who take it seriously, is different from the question of like, well, what if you knew the future? And I know you're very interested in this question, like, uh, you know, what, what if, uh, because then you get into these kinds of paradoxes of like information from the future, can it influence things in the present, particularly in ways that change the future so that it's no longer information in the future. So one way of asking this question is when Louise, when, when uh, Gary or Ian says to Louise, do you want to make a baby? And she says yes. Did she have any choice? I mean, she had already seen that the future involved a baby, right? Um, I'd say that in the story, she doesn't really, she doesn't have a choice. Uh, in the movie, it's, I think, uh, more uh, of a debatable question. But if we you know, confine our discussion to the story, I'd say that um, she doesn't have a choice in as much as, you know, she does not have really the option to say no. Um, sort of the, uh, but I'd say that, you know, sort of the, um, the point of the story is that emotionally she has, uh, uh, she has come to embrace that decision instead of uh, kind of recoiling in horror from it. Right. Uh, so that, you know, that is, I'd say, what is, um, that's sort of the point of the story. And that, that's kind of what I mean. Like that, I gather that you mean that take-home lesson, uh, which is illustrated via someone who knows the future, is kind of meant to apply to those of us who don't know the future, kind of, right? Um, okay, yes, in that sense, that is true. Um, well, because, okay, um, you know, so yeah, even though we don't know the specifics of our future, we do know certain things about our future. We know that we're going to die, we know that we will suffer loss. Um, you know, we know, uh, be, you know, as human beings, we know a lot of things about the future, which, um, which say animals do not, and they don't. That is, you know, that is part of the, the human condition. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, one of the things that we have to do to keep on living is to sort of find a way to, you know, reconcile, you know, the knowledge of these, you know, these things um, and continue to, you know, uh, move forward instead of curling up into a ball and uh, just, you know, uh, trying to uh, hide from it all. So, so in that sense, Yes, I would say yeah. You're you're right that the um, the emotional lesson of uh, that Louise has learned does have some applicability uh, to the rest of us, even though we don't um, have the specific knowledge of the future that Louise does. Like you know, if you have a child, that child will suffer, and there will be times when the child's suffering hurts you. I mean, you actually may not think about it. One of the wonders of being a human is you tend not to think about these things as much as you might. But if you think about it, you'll know all that. And, and, uh, and, and yet, so, so in a generic way, the question Louise faces is the question we all face. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, At a certain level of granularity. Yeah. So, um, okay, so... I know you wrote this piece for Nature, which was interesting because uh, I didn't know Nature ran pieces like this, right? I mean, it's uh, uh, it's called What's Expected of Us. I mean, um, for for uh, actually for I think uh, almost I think since the year two thousand, Nature has run um, short uh, like one page pieces of fiction. Um, uh, I don't think it is doing it, uh, like, uh, I don't know if they're doing it every issue for, for a number of years, they were running, you know, a one page piece of fiction 
in, I think, every issue. Um, uh, I'm not sure, you know, how often they're running them now, but uh, nature de- make, nature has uh, made it a practice of, you know, um, yeah, running these very short stories, um, uh, these short pieces of science fiction that, you know, they think, you know, uh, engage with scientific, scientific questions. And so this story of yours is about some uh, imagined device known as a predictor. And tell us what the predictor does. Uh, the predictor is a little device that uh, consists of a button and a light. And uh, the light flashes uh, a second before you push the button. So uh, the so it is uh, the light is an indicator of what you're going to do immediately uh, afterwards. And um, so in yeah in the story, people a lot of people they try and fake it out, but they find that they are you know they cannot fake it out. And um, and a lot of people are um, profoundly disturbed by the consequences uh, when when they by the when they think through the consequences of this. Right. So if they try to press it without it predicting the press, as soon as they move in that direction, they see the light go on. They can't beat the light. And also, whenever the light does go on, whether or not they felt they were going to press it, they then will press it. Is that it? Yes. They can resolve to, you know, that when they see the light, they will not press it. Mm-hmm. But, um, but that never works, either because the light never actually goes on, uh, or um, for whatever reason, when the, when the light does go on, mm-hmm. you know, they wind up pressing the button. And... The way this works in the story is that, you know, you, it's premised on the idea that information can, can pass from the future to the present. That's how the device works. And the question is, well, what implications would that have? It's kind of the, the Louise question, you know, if, you know, if, we, if, if we knew uh, the future. And in this scenario, uh, in this story, a, a, a fair number of people kind of go crazy or, or get pathologically depressed or something by this by the fact of this kind of information being available, right? Uh, yes, yes. That that that's uh, that that's the scenario in the story. Yes. Yeah. Is that? But but that's not a particular position of yours on what the implications would be of knowing the future. Well, or? well okay. So, um, uh, so it seems to me that you know there are. Um, a few logically possible scenarios, and uh, uh, it's unclear to me, you know, uh, which is the most likely of these. But like, if we assume that it's possible for information to uh, travel backward in time, if we assume that as a premise, then um, you know, th- then I think you know that raises some. Uh, some tough questions, because uh, let's say you receive information that you're going to walk across the street tomorrow and be hit by a bus and break both your legs. Um, since we have, you know, assumed that this information is accurate, you know, there is, you know, there's no way that you can, you know, uh, prevent this from happening. You cannot resolve to not cross the street. So. Um, so what does this mean? Does this mean that you, despite your best wishes, will cross the street and, uh, get hit, get hit by a bus and break both your legs? Um, that seems really counterintuitive to us because, you know, who would do that? Um, yeah, so, Okay. So you know that, but that is one possibility. What that, that you know that that. that and is, again, who would embrace the prospect of being, being hit by a bus and say, "Yeah, here I go." Yes. Right. Yes. So, um, so it seems like you know. Uh, uh, so one possibility is that you know it would involve you know some very strange mental states, you know, which you know we are you know it's hard for us to to picture. 
Like another logically possible scenario is that you never receive any bad news because nothing ever bad happens again once we've invented this device. That you know, like you know, that is logically possible. You know, like, that you only get good news about the future, and then so you're like, okay, I'm you know, I'm looking forward to that. That is logically possible, but I, I think you know, unlikely. You know, if. But at, least, but at least it gets around this problem of people either deciding not to walk in front of the bus and yet for some reason walking in front of it and the equally unlikely scenario of people saying, yeah, I'm going to walk. I'm really eager about walking in front of that bus. So yes. words, that's how this scenario arises as a way to get around those two paradoxes. Yes. So um, so so again, you know, you know, so this is logically possible. Seems, you know, seems unlikely. But yeah, but yeah, it, it, it is certainly a logical possibility. Um, the scenario I, uh, that I depict in the story, um, what's expected of us, is um, uh, I suppose uh, it, you, you know you uh, you could call it maybe the null case. It's um, uh, it's a situation where, like, everyone falls into a kind of catatonic state. So, on one hand, you know, you could say, like, this is, yeah, this is a combination. It's like, it's, it's a very strange mental state, and also kind of nothing bad ever happens to you again. It is, it is, a, it is a stable state in that, you know, yeah, you know, there, there are no, you know, there's no possibility of these sort of odd feedback loops. Because once you're in a catatonic state, you know, you are no longer getting, you know, information about the future that you want to avoid. You know, you are, uh, you know, you're in a, in a, in a completely stable state. Um, so, you know, this is logically possible and, you know, uh, it uh, kind of, you know, in some ways resolves the questions that we had uh, from, with the other scenarios. Because, you know, in some ways it's, it's less unlikely than uh, people, you know, happily walking into buses. It's also less unlikely than the scenario of nothing bad ever happens to anyone ever again. Um, so, uh, so you know, it, it sort of resolves, you know, the problems posed by these other scenarios. Um, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's not a super uh, uh, happy scenario. But, you know, like I said, it's logically possible, and it seems, you know, uh, less unlikely than some of the others. Now, um, so, uh, like, a lot of people would also, you know, a lot of people say, like, well, you know, the problem here is that, you know, the premise is flawed. You know, they'd say the problem is that information cannot, pass, you know, come backwards in time. Because like if you because if we if we simply say like well that's that's impossible then you know we don't we avoid this issue altogether, um, and you know that you know this is this is uh, I think this is still a uh, an un, an unresolved question because um, uh, the physicist Kip Thorne has. Uh, he has posited scenarios in which it seems like it should be possible to, you know, uh, you use a wormhole to create a time machine and then, you know, send objects or information back in time. And uh, that does not violate relativity. Um, you know, he, you know, he acknowledges that, you know, uh, you know, uh, there are there are a lot of unanswered questions about that, and it may be that um, future discoveries will determine that it is actually impossible. But right now, he cannot you know he cannot rule it out on the basis of you know physical law. So, um, so you know I think that you know that uh, be, you know, un until we can rule it out on the basis of physical law, you know I think. Uh, you know, this this remains you know sort of an interesting question. Yeah. Um. You know, it it occurred to me. Well, first, I want to say that like, 
I mean, all these things lead to paradoxes, right? Like, whenever in a movie, like when they travel backward in time, I mean, of course, there's the famous kind of grandfather's paradox. Well, then you'd have the opportunity to kill your grandfather who had given rise to you, and and, and how could you then be there in the present to travel back, right? Or, or that, uh, But there's also just the fact that, like, wait a second. <laughs> in these movies, this person goes back into this past time, and they, like, occupy space in the time. Well, you can't do... You know, if you displace, if you occupy space, you would displace uh, some things that existed in the past and it wouldn't be the past, right? I mean, so even at, at, a, at a more elementary level, it starts getting hard to wrap your mind around, right? Well, um, well, okay, here. So, uh, uh, I, can de- I can describe Kip Thorne's thought experiment for building a time machine, if you'd like. Sure. Okay, so... Um, uh so you know it it relativity does admit the possibility of wormholes so you know some a uh sort of a a passage connecting two different points without having you to requiring you to cross the intervening space uh conventionally so you know say if you create a wormhole you can mount say one mouth of the wormhole in your lab and the other mouth of the wormhole in, say, a spaceship. And then wherever that spaceship goes, you'll be able to go there instantly by stepping through the mouth of the wormhole that's in your lab. And you know, you'll, you'll get to the destination without having, you know, had to endure the you know, lengthy travel time that the spaceship mm-hmm. uh, undertook on that journey. So, okay. Uh, yeah, wormholes, so, okay, so, by the way, wormholes were involved in somewhat this capacity in the movie Interstellar. Is that right? Uh, uh, yeah, I think they were. Uh, okay. Yes, yes so, they were. Okay, sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> okay, so Kip Thorne uh, uh, you know, posits this, that scenario. You have, you, you've mounted one mouth of the wormhole in your lab, the other mouth in a, in a spaceship. Now, he says, imagine that the spaceship... Uh, goes on a journey near the speed of light. It's going to go to a, a star 10 light years away and then come back. So it's going to take 20 years to do that trip, but it's going to be moving so fast that from the perspectives of someone on the ship, the total travel time will only be, say, one year subjectively. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, so let's, let's imagine this scenario. You are in the lab. Uh, you can look through the wormhole, and you see the spaceship captain piloting the ship. Uh, and you're watching, you know, you're watching their view of the, you know, uh, the stars whizzing by, whatever that looks like at relativistic speeds. Uh, within six months, they have reached their destination, and then they uh, uh, do a 180 and then head back to Earth. So in another six months, uh, they are back on Earth. You see the spaceship captain, you know, the, the Earth comes into view. They land the, the spaceship uh, on the lawn outside your lab. Um, now, if you go outside your lab and look at your lawn, there's no spaceship there. Because, you know, the spaceship is still, it's only one, only one year has passed. The spaceship is still en route to its destination. By your reckoning, from your yes. perspective. Yes. But if you walk back into the lab and look through the wormhole, that spaceship has landed on the lawn outside your lab, you know, uh, and it is, uh, if you were to step through that wormhole onto the ship and then, and then deboard that ship, you would, you know, you are now standing on the lawn 20 years in your future because, you know, because 20 years have, has passed, it, you know, it was only due to the time dilation experienced on the ship that it, you know, that, uh, you know, the ship captain experienced only a year happening. Mm-hmm. So now we have a time machine where you, you know, you've been able to step through the wormhole and move 20 years, travel 20 years into your future. And it turns out that there is this incredible, you know, uh, ticker tape parade of people waiting for the arrival of this ship. 
Um, and now, see, those people, you know, they can board the ship, enter the wormhole from the other direction, come back into your lab, and now they're 19 years in their past. Okay. So, you know, they, they now have access to, you know, they, they basically have access to their past. They are moving backwards in time. Now, okay, so let's say that um, uh, since, you know, you were, you know, let's say you, uh, let's say you're there meeting the ship on its arrival, that a 20-year-old a 20 year, 20 year older version of you is meeting the ship on its arrival, you, you know, when the ship lands, you climb in, step through the wormhole, back into your lab. So, you know, uh, your 20-year-old self can now meet, 20-year-older self can meet your current self, you. And, um, you know, can your, uh, but, you know, that 20-year-old older self, you know, that, that person presumably has the memory of having been in the lab and being met by, you know, his older self. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, um, uh, so, okay, so, you know, what does this do to your free will? Are you able to say, like, you know what? You know, like, yeah, my 20-year-old older self has come and visit can I resolve to not be there when the ship lands in 20, in, you know, in 19 years? Can I, can I resolve to, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm moving to Antarctica. I'm not going to be there. Um, you know, uh, does, you know, it's not clear, you know, how, the, you know, how to resolve this. Um, Kip Thorne, you know, actually, you know, Kip Thorne acknowledged that, you know, you know, there's no way to model the behavior of human beings in a, you know, in any sort of, you know, calculable uh, way. So, so Kip Thorne, he, he actually came up with a scenario using billiard balls to try and, you know, resolve this question. So he imagined, like, let's say you have, you know, a wormhole where there's only, say, one second, these wormhole... One, uh, this wormhole lets you go back in time, say, one second. And he, he imagined, like, okay, so let, you could position the mouths of these wormholes in such a way that, like, you knock a billiard ball into one mouth of the, billiard, uh, of the wormhole, and it comes out of the other mouth of the wormhole a second prior to it entering. Okay, and are... These are different spaces as well as times? Well, uh, you know, you can mount them both on the surface of a billiard table. Right. So, and then this, this is sort of a, a version of the predictor that, you know, a billiard ball is coming out of one mouth of the wormhole, you know, a second before it enters the other one. So, in that sense, it seems like, you know, uh, yeah, when, when a billiard ball comes out of, of this one mouth, we know a billiard ball has to go into the other one. Because you know, we just saw one come out, mm -hmm. but he said, "Like, okay, you can arrange these wormholes such that the billiard ball that's coming, you know, coming out, this billiard ball that arrived from the future, it can intercept itself as it is, you know, on its way into the wormhole. It can knock itself off course." So this is basically the grandfather paradox done in billiard balls. Right. But, but this is also a scenario with, that, you know, you can actually set up some equations for and solve. Okay. So, so he did that and, you know, tried to see what, you know, what, what solutions, you know, like how do you, you know, what, what does the, what does the math tell you will happen? And what did the math tell him? Um, well, uh, one solution is that the billiard ball um, uh, a billiard ball comes out of the the mouth of the wormhole at an angle, and it knocks itself a glancing blow 
And that glancing blow is enough to deflect it off course so it enters the other mouth of the wormhole at a slightly different angle. And that is why the billiard ball exited at an angle. And so, so the billiard ball was not able to knock itself off course. It was just able to you know, deflect it enough to prevent it from completely knocking itself off course. Hmm. So this is, a, this is a, a consistent solution. You know, this, uh, this, worth, this, this, this can work you know, mathematically. Um, but, you know, what does that mean in human terms? Right. What does that look like? Do you kill your dealing... grandfather or not? You just kill yeah. him a glancing blow? <laughs> well, or, or even say just you, you know, it doesn't have to be your grandfather. It's just you, you know, what does it, what does it look like, you know, if you come out, if, I mean, if you, if you decide to stop yourself from entering the wormhole, uh, in the future, mm-hmm. Like, if, does it mean that, you know, yeah, you can't. All you can do is, you know, you, you might be able to interact with yourself, but there's nothing, there's no way for you to, you know, actually prevent yourself from entering the wormhole and traveling back in time. Okay. I'll have to take his word for that uh, for the time being. But you know what occurred to me is that uh, as for your predictor device, seems like in principle there would be a way of building such a device that didn't involve information moving from the future to the present. I mean, are you, or, or a device something like this, you're familiar with these uh, experiments by Benjamin Labette some time ago? So, yes, yes. So uh, what he, you know, and these are subject to some dispute, the interpretation of them, but, but his reading is that, uh, you know, um, and they've done more advanced versions of them with, like, brain scans. But anyway, the idea is if you if you put somebody uh, in front of, like, a, a clock with, like, a sweeping second hand or something and say, okay, press the button whenever you feel like it, and then note where the second hand is when you decided to press the button and tell us when that point in time is, uh, then meanwhile, they're monitoring various action potentials or various physical stuff going on in your brain. And his claim is that before you're consciously aware of making that decision, well in advance of that, the process of pressing the button is actually set in motion in your brain. So if you made a device where the light went on when that physical stuff starts happening in your brain, then... Uh, it would seem right. It would perform very much like your predictor, right? Um, it would. Um, the difference uh, with the predictor, as posited in the story, is that um, uh, fun thing. Like you know, it works even if you try and set up some mechanical system for button pushing or not, which uh, Lebet's experiment, you know, obviously would not work. Um, it would also the predictor in the story, you know, it works like sort of with inadvertent button pushes, you know, accidental button pushes, which again, Libets does not. Mm-hmm. Um, also, you know, it is possible, um, that it, you could, um, if you, you know, extend the sort of negative time lag, uh, on the predictor, uh, which you could probably do by just, you know, hooking up 10 of them in sequence, then, um, then you, you'd have a prediction 10 seconds in advance. And that is long, you know, that is well before, right. you know, any action potential arises in the brain. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, like for a, you know, for a sort of a, a limited small scale, you know, uh, scenario, uh, Libet's experiment does, you know, sort of emulate the, the device in the story. And it would be pretty weird, I think. It would feel pretty weird. Um, so let me. Uh, so we've been uh, talking a long time, longer well, than. Well, although it's also possible, it's also possible that if we actually tried to wire that up, you know, where a light flashed, uh, based on action potentials in your brain, it's possible that uh, you'd notice the light going on, and then you know. Well, that's action, <clears throat> that's the question. I mean, yeah, I don't know what I don't know what Labette would predict, but one scenario is no, the train has already left the station. 
And because after all, the whole upshot of the experiment is that consciousness is a lagging indicator. Yes. Yes. And and so you could say, well, you could imagine, well, no, sorry, but the train has left the station, and you can sit there and go, no, I'm going to stop it, having seen the light flash. But against your will, so to speak, you would go ahead and press the button. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, that so that that's something that would uh, require some, you know, that would be could easily be experimentally yeah. tested. Yeah. Well, they should. <laughs> um, um, all right. Well, so thank you for taking all of this time. Um, and I guess so in closing, you're, you're like, uh, if you have any guidance for those of us who are wrestling with this free will and determinism problem, it is, well, actually one more thing I, I should ask you is like, I gather you are a so-called compatibilist. Yes. Which, which is that, you know, and if, if people want to know what compatibilism is, they can read Dan Dennett's book, Freedom Evolves, in which he puts forth a compatibilist view, meaning that actually free will and determinism are compatible. Now, my own reaction to that book was, well, that's only true if you define free will in a sense that isn't of much interest to most people who wrestle with this problem. But that said, uh, you are, you are, this is your, your view that we can hang on to a notion of uh, free will in the face of determinism, of some meaningful notion of free will. Yes, yes. Because, um, well, uh, you know, obviously this is a very complicated question, but, you know, sort of, you know, simply to, you know, sort of oversimplify, I feel like um, an incompatibilist kind of would like uh, would like to, the, the the possibility of you deciding to choose A or you deciding to choose B, um, even if the you know uh, you know the history of the universe up to that point is exactly the same, you know in the scenario that you choose A, and in the scenario that you choose B. Um, that that you know that that is not your your decision. Uh, is is the only thing that makes the difference between you choosing A and you choosing B. Nothing prior to that does. And I feel like, you know, that is, you know, that would mean that your decision to choose A or B is not based on any of your experience at all. Because in both cases, your experience is exactly the same, and in one case you made a choice to choose A, in the other case you cho chose B. So your decision was not based on anything that happened to you in your life. Nothing you learned, nothing you read, nothing you experienced. And I think that is not what we want. I don't, I don't think that's what, I don't think that's what we want from free will to say like, yes, my decision, you know, had no basis at all in any of my prior experience. I think what we want is what Dennett says that, you know, uh, your decision is a result, like I said, a, you know, your, your decision is the outcome of this, you know, extraordinarily complicated computation that took all of your life experience as inputs. Um, uh, that is, um, you know, it, it is, it is, it is not a, um, it does not make you a simple, you know, uh, predictable mechanism. Because the you know, this complication, this computation is so uh, so complicated that uh, you know for some some decisions you know it is impossible for anyone else to like you know try and duplicate that. Uh, the only you know the only thing in the universe that you know can perform that computation is you. You with you know all all of your life experiences, yeah, and um, so you know I think I, I, I you know I think I feel like you know that's what that's what we want to to be the case. We don't want our decisions to have no basis in our prior experience. We want it to be you know you know a sort of a very let's say nuanced. Uh, consideration of our prior experience, and you know, and that is the basis of our actions, and that is what I think you know, determinism, you know, offers, and you know, 
So I, you know, I side with Bennett in saying, you know, that is the, you know, what he what he calls, you know, the variety of free will worth having is entirely compatible with determinism. Some some other version of free will where, you know, you can make a decision that has no basis whatsoever in, you know, the past. I don't think that's a variety of free will that is worth having, worth wanting. No, but if you if you ask a lot of people, I think they do want a variety of free will where their behavior is something other than the inevitable consequence of what had happened to them up to that point. And in the compatibilist view, ultimately what you do is the inevitable consequence of what has happened to you up to that point. I mean, the reason people don't like that is because it makes the sensation of choice, the conscious sensation of choice, superfluous. Yeah, it seems superfluous. You've got this feeling that you're intervening in the causal stream when you make a choice. People like that feeling. I mean, actually, you, as I said, you could argue it either way. There's some things I don't like about it, but whatever. That I think that's... I, I think for some people, the choice they want to have is a choice that is a departure from inevitability. Well, you know, I think... Um... I think the I think the resistance to that is because people uh, conflate inevitability with predictability. Um, I think mean, people don't want to think people don't want to think that their actions were predictable. That uh, that someone else would have said like, "Yeah, I saw that coming." Well, they don't have to worry about that because we know that behavior is not predictable, right? I mean, um, yes. Yeah, so you know, uh, so I, but I guess I. I feel like you know that is um, that is what uh, leads to the sort of antipathy toward uh, this idea because because of this association with inevitability with predictability um, and I think that you know when you say like you know, we have this experience of making a decision you know that's that's that unique computation being performed. That is what it is. That you know. That's how we experience that you know that computation being performed. Yeah. Well, we're we're heading into a discussion of what consciousness is, and uh, probably that would really be pressing our luck having talked about this for ninety minutes. But it, you know, it'd be fun to talk about it down the road if you think you'll have time again. I I, I uh, all this stuff is endlessly fascinating to me, and I know you I know you have views on consciousness, and they are of course related to this. But, uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I'd certainly be up for having a, another conversation about this at some point. Okay, well maybe maybe we'll do that down the road and and uh, focus on consciousness, which is certainly not unrelated to the question of determinism, but opens up a whole bunch of questions of its own. So meanwhile, uh, people, what's the, what's the name of the collection of short stories that Story of Your Life is in? It's called uh, Stories of Your Life and Others. And Others, okay. Uh, and was it always called that, even before that particular story became famous? For, I mean, via the movie? Fa acquired fame via, via the movie? Yeah, the collection was always called that. Okay. And is, are there other things people should be looking for, like a website, a Facebook page, a Twitter feed, or a book you've got coming out, or another book you're particularly proud of? Um, uh, there... There's nothing... I, I don't have anything else to hawk at the moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, someday you will. I predict that. Uh, I, I know that much about the future. And uh, people should read it when you do. So, thank you so much, Ted, for uh, taking the time. Uh, thanks, Bob. I, I enjoyed it. Okay. Take care. <laughs>